Good morning to our colleagues in Asia, or afternoon or evening, depending on your time zone. Uh, welcome to our Duke CE LinkedIn Live event, the Agile Dashboard, providing foresight for leaders. Uh, we at Duke CE are dedicated to getting leaders ready for what's next, and the Agile Dashboard tries to bring the latest thinking from global business leaders to help us understand how they're applying the concepts of the Agile Dashboard to their organizations to better navigate uncertainty and seize upon opportunities. Today, I am very pleased to have our special guest, Anna Gong, who's the CEO and founder of Perks Technologies as our guest. Uh, Perks Technologies is a category creating lifestyle marketing software as a service platform, helping traditional enterprise transform from transient transactional businesses to delivering meaningful engagements and experiences in the digital economy. Uh, basically, enterprises are trying to become mobile first. Uh, they're trying to create new rev revenue streams to become marketplaces, both on the buyer and seller side. And Perks has created um, a concept which they call the lifestyle marketing platform that enables uh, customers to redefine customer engagement, to measure it, and to define e-commerce marketplaces. And so we brought Anna in as a specialist to help us talk about what some of the changes in the market are, how she's been engaging with customers to try and measure that data, which is very important in today's world, and to give her personal leadership lessons because she's had an amazing story of success in starting up this company in Singapore. So welcome, Anna, to the show. <clears throat> Thank you, Joe, um, for having me. Yes, so uh, my name is Joe Perfetti. I'm an innovation fellow with Duke Corporate Education. I also am a lecturer at the University of Maryland College Park. I am the host of the show. And joining me today, we will have a panel that will include two additional colleagues, uh, basically John Davis, who is a regional managing director at Duke Corporate Education, and Scott Coer, who is a uh, vice dean of uh, graduate education at the Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine, and also heads up their marketing. Uh, so he is gonna be talking about some of these concepts as well. Uh, from a U.S.-based perspective. But as we get started here today, uh, if you have any questions or comments as viewers, please feel free to put them in the comment box, uh, and Anna is happy to respond as we go through the session. Okay, But we're going to start out with just a, a couple of, of questions to set the table. So as I said, Anna is redefining the marketplace for CRM technologies to basically move towards, I guess, what she's calling a lifestyle experience. So Anna, if you can explain to our viewers, what is that shift in the marketplace that Perks is kind of riding the way for and, and transforming this marketing aspect? Thank you. Uh, I believe that, you know, uh, when we first pivoted, we looked at loyalty management systems as the, the place that we would probably disrupt the most. Unfortunately, when you look at loyalty management systems, they're run like ERPs or ledgers, right? And it's a very sophisticated ledger system of earning and burning points and calculating of that. And we realize that it's bolted on to a very archaic system and process in the back end, and it's run by procurement and operational um, as, uh, you know, resources. And then when you move you know, two, three decades later, uh, to the, the current economy where mobile first fintech and lifestyle and super apps, you know, it's merged out of Asia, the term. And if you think about what traditional brands are challenged with, it's really not the earning and burning of points. It's really how am I giving my uh, customers uh, optionalities and lifestyle oriented essential services or products to feel outside of my core. So if I'm a bank or a telco or even an airline, you know, you, you hear uh, Air Asia and Singapore Airlines becoming uh, innovative outside of their core, becoming super apps. They're creating lifestyle oriented services because they have to, right? And so this whole paradigm shift uh, away from core and becoming lifestyle apps and super apps is really feeling the, the whole Asia landscape. So, so sorry, you broke up there at the very last end, but let me just follow up with a quick question because uh, I've not really heard the term super app too much. That's relatively new language for me. So can you help me understand what is the super app and, and how is that different from a traditional mobile app? Yes, so if you think about what uh, Tencent, the WeChat ecosystem has created out of China, Alibaba and so forth, these guys, it's 
kind of infected the, the Asia landscape. And when you look at how Uber actually exited China and Southeast Asia because they couldn't localize and innovate fast enough, Grab actually brought out Uber and Grab became a super app overnight and act, bolting on different services beyond just ride hailing. You know, now they, you can go into uh, the Grab app. It, it's all the services that you could imagine. It's becoming a super marketplace. And so how do you essentially become a FinTech player with a wallet? as well as, you know, way beyond ride hailing and food delivery was, uh, you know, we, we uh, benefited from all those services uh, during COVID. But when you go to the, the app, you're paying with the Grab Pay, you know, FinTech wallet, you're actually consuming all these other products and services from their, um, you know, even micro insurance, um, watching videos, playing games. Uh, so there's so many aspects of a super app that really to tailor the, the moving um, essential lifestyle demands of consumers. Consumers are driving their corporate strategy, right? So how is this different from a CRM-based system that we've had traditionally? Oh, this is a, a touchy, uh, maybe a, even a controversial statement, but CRM is going to die a pretty slow death in the upcoming uh, <laughs> few years. Uh, you know, we say loyalty is dead. And there are some people who say CRM is dead because you're dealing with a lot of historical data that's sitting on the archive, you know, in the vault. And then you're crunching those numbers and crunching data sets and understanding it from a historical analysis. But when you're dealing with mobile first digital economy, you gotta deal with data and emotion. And data and emotion, how am I going to instantly gratify my customers? How do I personalize everything around their lifestyle um, beyond just core banking, beyond core telco services and so forth. And so, you know, those who have done it really well uh, are some of the commerce uh, companies as well as the ad tech companies. But even that is not enough because it offers, you know, a, a singular service. And now all the super apps are coming, you know, emerging out of the woodwork. India, you see uh, MBNO, a telco like Reliance Geo has partnered with some of the major companies become you know, a major super app, super marketplace. And then Tata is now coming, you know, out to say we're going to compete or become another, you know, super app. And TCS is not known to become a super app, right? So everyone's now racing to become that, you know, target super app so that they can monetize on their um, user base. So I think you choose your words probably very intentionally. And, and I, I heard one thing about, okay, so part of what becomes a super app is you're dealing with, data in motion in real time over digital. But your company is trying to drive what you call a customer engagement platform. How is that different in terms of what's in the marketplace versus going forward versus what we have today? Well, if you think about even just building a two-sided marketplace or a ecosystem, just you're slapping different products and services in that marketplace. And it's fantastic. Now customers are getting more services and products um, out of your um, you know, mobile and, and user base. But what is actually missing is just, you know, you can't just slap a directory. It's just a, it's a listing of products and services. How do you now engage and bring the customers back? How do you reward them relevantly based on milestones, different uh, types of user activities that the, you are campaigning it for them to Spend, to refer a friend to do certain activities, convert to e-billing, to you know transact five times this month, and that kind of engine of sophistication uh, to drive user activity is what we're, we're trying to redefine. It has to by um, a, a different way of engaging customers. So just to help me and, and the people that are watching this get a metaphor for what we're talking about. Um, I took a screenshot right before this uh, show of my cell phone company, which in the United States is called T-Mobile. And I, I'd like you to tell me why this isn't a super app, because it seems like these telcos are creating a lot of data. They tell me what my bill is. They allow me to buy a new phone. Uh, they allow me to add services. I can buy cases. Is that a super app? And is this part of the data that they use? This is exactly what Asian companies are moving away from. So if you do, you know, I share with you another screenshot of one of the largest telcos that we're working with in Asia. If you open that screen up, uh, essentially, that's a telco. It doesn't look like a telco, does it? <laughs> so, you know, people all, look like a telco. This is not a telco. Yeah. <laughs> 
So you're giving them FMB, lifestyle, you know, retail services, micro insurance, media, gaming. So there's so many different things now. They're creating a new revenue outside of court. We can only sell so many SIM cards and prepaid you know, uh, services and post pay services. So that's where a lot of the dynamics is. You're going to see more of that from banks coming out. You're going to see wallets emerging as super apps because fintech itself is it cannot you know survive. So everyone's trying to build a super ecosystem. But two part two points here, and in just a second, I'm going to try and bring in my colleagues. But first of all, when you try and build a super ecosystem, I think there's a data point from CIO Magazine, we have the banner here, that says one third of all CRM projects fail. So, so I assume that this is not easy to do. And, and so the second piece is that another client I work with says that their data lakes have become data swamps. Like mm -hmm. how do you know what the right data to engage with? Because you have all these interactions and don't organizations become overwhelmed? So that whole technical debt and the technical legacy is becoming like a Frankenstein model. And how do you now take some of this data you know, in place and monetize on it? We're actually basing it on real-time data. So basing on user activity in real time, spending patterns, you know, user activity in the app. We know exactly what you're doing at the moment that we're triggering this campaign. And so whatever data in the back end Fantastic. Let your data science and data engineers and marketing analysis or analysts just crunch all of those different types of data points and understand your customers from a very historical basis and segment them and do whatever you want to do with that data point. But what we're trying to do is now use real-time activity to fuel more activity from the users and reward them instantly. Instant gratification is missing from most of these traditional enterprises. So we are not trying to restore or trying to you know, make CRM better. We're actually trying to get away from CRM. We don't need to integrate with CRM. We just based on all the user activities and you just call our APIs. And this is an API low code to no code economy. So this is, it's almost like a too, too innovative of a, a term, but it's been flying around recently, low code to no code. And that you know, scares a lot of the CIOs. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure it does, especially on the enterprise side, because what I what I hear in what you say, timing seems to be important. And I guess one of the challenges is CRM looks so far backwards that by time you figure it out, it's almost too late uh, right. to engage with the customer. Is that what you're basically saying? Your customers don't even have eight second attention span. You know, or our attention span is lower than the fish. <laughs> so, and, and so, how do you then connect what your Customers, and this is why we actually work with data in motion, not data at rest, like CRM. Yeah. And, and it seems like technology is now catching up to the point where we can start doing this. So I'd, I'd like to bring in my colleagues, uh, Scott and John, who've been listening to this conversation. And one of the, the topics I want to move to is, is the data itself. Uh, the show is called the Agile Dashboard. And, and part of the Agile Dashboard is how do leaders you know, figure out what data is telling them where the market is going as opposed to where it's been. So it's very forward looking and interpret that. What what do you tell leaders to look at? What is on your dashboard for this data in motion to understand this monetization concept? So this is interesting. Um, we're now giving real time data and fees, you know, if you think about how much marketing waste and investment has been poured into large companies and big brands, 80% of the marketing spend has been focusing on acquisition. And this is the problem. Um, it, so you're chasing after this really endless loop and reinvesting back into acquisition because churn is becoming, your customers are becoming very transactional and transient. And because you don't know how to engage them, giving them better um, services and relevance. And so this is where we're trying to move away from even loyalty. You know, I think traditionally we think, okay, we got to fix this. Our customers are churning. Let's slap a loyalty program <laughs> and then they will come and they will stay. Fix engagement. This is the whole point about if you're talking about dashboards and, and data and real time, work with your customers in real time, delight them. And how do you become digitally delightful digital natives as an enterprise? And that's where we're trying to work at. 
And it sounds like you're, you know, this is sort of uh, Kurzweilian, you know, that this great convergence of, you know, bringing everything to a single location. Is this, is this generational? Will generations be left behind who are not technologically agile? And note my gray hair as I ask that question for you. <laughs> I, I hope that won't be a focal point of your response, of course. Yeah, so we see that while the big commerce guys like you know Amazon, Shopee here locally, um, Shopify is even going to B2C, right? Um, they just launched this uh, earlier last year, um, their B2C business strategy. And everyone wants to monetize on the consumer space. And then you have the ad tech giants, you know, Facebook and Google and these guys trying to move into the commerce space. But the, the commerce guys have become such a robust ad tech platform because they have built enough data points and consumer activity. So as you see the, these two kind of sparring, they're going to continue to spar for market share. But then the large enterprises with millions of customers and their closed loop system, like a bank, let's say for the last 50 years, I've acquired, you know, maybe 50 million customers. What am I doing with that 50 million customers? Now I have to evolve myself to now innovate outside of my core. I can't just you know, do more banking. I got to look at what are some of the net new revenue streams. So this closed loop system, the enterprises have been left behind. No one's actually helping them become that two-sided marketplace while these big giants are completely stealing all of their customers. They can just turn the light on and say, I want to become an insurance platform or a payment or a banking platform. And they're going to lose all of those. So now these traditional enterprises are moving more and more into the super app space to combat that. You know, they don't have to go through another 20 years to acquire millions of customers. They already have it. So CAC is not their issue, customer acquisition. And so the problem is, how do I build that ecosystem quickly and monetize on it? ecosystem because I already have 50 million customers, right? So you see the whole paradigm shift. And then in the future, in the next few years, and maybe three to five years, you're going to see a lot more of these large enterprises emerging as biggest competitors to these tech giants because they own the data themselves. Yeah. But, but Anna, go ahead, John. No, I was going to, let me build off of Scott's question there for a moment, because I think it's a very interesting point. What you've done at Perks and is, is not for the faint of heart, right? If you think about the transformation you've engineered at this company, is much like the transformation you're trying to get other companies to do as well. Um, and the question for me is, is how do you, what would you recommend for them as the tangible, simple steps they could take to become more digitally facile, just better at this, just because they may not have the same level of sort of path-breaking ambition, uh, but they know what they need to do it because, as you say, CRM is going to die a slow death and their customers have the attention spans of fish. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's a good question. There, there is really, I mean, this is said so many times and it comes back down to leadership. And unfortunately, when you have a cultural shift, cultural transformation, it has to come from the top down. And companies think that they can do it with the same people at top, and that's not going to work. The other, you know, we, we've seen an evolution of these traditional enterprises completely standing up separate subsidiaries uh, or maybe acquiring tech companies and then moving uh, uh, or building a net new team that is completely under a separate PL and let them grow like a startup. I want you to innovate outside of the core. And one of the largest telcos that we're working with, the group CEO in Asia, he said, you know, there's no point for me to help transition my elephant and this beast, the legacy. And the mindset is actually a lost cause. I cannot transition that fast enough. Mm. Let me build a separate digital, you know, incubation or digital lifestyle company and let them run and pick the best breed technologies to partner with as well. And we'll do some homegrown stuff. But I want this business unit to, in the next few years, the revenue to overcome my traditional telco. Uh, revenue. So this is the the hacks of these, you know, very innovative challengers and mindsets of le leadership. But you know, we're we're going to see a lot of shifts, um, and these are the you know the evolution that we're seeing in Asia. So when you when you think about this ecosystem, Anna, and you know, I, I it, it's just so impressive to think systemically about this. Are you looking at this as creating more inclusive ecosystems where more parties will be able to play, you know, the adjacencies, 
you know, looking at the data, looking at what I interact with, knowing almost intuitively what I want to do. If it's lunchtime and I'm banking, you know, I, I see the myriad of restaurants. Or does this create more exclusive marketplaces? Will there be winner? Will there be more losers than winners in this new world order? Which I, I think you're right. It's not just I think you're right. You, you, you know, Asia is demonstrating mm -hmm. that, uh, as you say, the super apps and the uh, engagement of consumers in the space, you know, leaves north america behind uh so is it more inclusive in your ecosystem or is it exclusive i think it's going to be a bit of both uh, if you think about um the next few years or maybe the next decade um there's going to be a massive convergence you know if facebook and google and these big commerce guys are seeing that the neo banks coming out the you know the neo uh, fintechs a lot of the the major enterprises are innovate much faster and if you see that ecosystem now growing you know and innovating faster they're going to capture market share they're going to become the the latest ad tech platform because they built the ecosystem they have their you know merchants as well as partners and they have millions of customers. So they will start to become the choice, the brand choice to go in to buy, consume lifestyle oriented you know, services and products. And they have also the, the mold, which is the FinTech play. I'm already very loyal to my bank. I don't leave my bank very often. If they offer me a very lifestyle mobile first digital you know, experience, and it's a very positive experience, why would I go anywhere else? And so you're going to see evolutions of convergence and these big giants, tech giants may actually acquire some of these and the traditional followers who are moving too slowly because of poor leadership and direction will actually stay behind and, and they're going to be gone. You know, there's a study that was saying that 75% of S&P 500 won't last in the next seven years. This is pre-COVID, by the way, the study. And, and the, the long-term span of the you know, lifespan of these traditional enterprises used to be 60 years, you know, uh, around World War II. Now it's becoming, the lifespan is 18 years, if that. Now during COVID and that, we're gonna see a lot more brands dying. We just closed a 160 year brand uh, in Singapore as a retail brand uh, called Robinson's. It's like a Macy's of, you know, of the US. And so you're gonna see a lot more of these brands getting sunset and banks and telcos are not, you know, not dissimilar. So Anna, and, and by the way, anybody watching, if you have questions for Anna, please feel free to put them in the chat and we're happy to pose them to her. Uh, but I, I'm listening to this and I'm, I'm hearing your responses to Scott and John and I'm thinking, okay, I understand the idea that the benefit of the closed system and I could see the JDs.com doing this. I can see the Amazons, et cetera, the 10 cents. I can even see a bank doing this because I, I kind of know all the transactions like get involved in this, maybe an insurance company. But then I get to like Cafe Pacific or John's client Nike. How do they become this lifestyle closed loop enabler? Because it seems like just they're such a small part of the loop that yeah. they, they can't really get to that next step. What would you say to the, the executives of those organizations? <laughs> so I, I would say that they are already doing it. Um, the next evolution would be these consumer product groups or packaged goods, FMC, GCPG brands will become FinTech players. They, or they will acquire more tech players. I mean, come on, Nike just got a, a ServiceNow CEO. They're, they're becoming tech oriented. They're a tech company yeah. that makes shoes. <laughs> So, okay. so Cathay Pacific, go back to the airline. Cathay. Yeah. So, so Cathay, you know, even just Singapore Airlines and Air Asia, not just Cathay. In Asia, these airlines are now really innovating outside of the core. Cathay actually has a fintech play already. Uh, you know, Singapore Airlines just launched their Chris Pay, uh, and then Air Asia has Big Pay. So every one of these airlines have a fintech as a mold, as an underlying, you know, transactional system. And then I can now build all these different services. Now you continuously transact and I can really track the user behavior and consumption behavior. And that's key to building, you know, that ecosystem. And they're already evolving. So our, our third set of questions, by the way, revolves around personal leadership. 
And I strongly encourage people to, to find more about your personal story. But basically, part of your story involved, when you came to this company, they were the not customer engagement platform. They were doing more traditional marketing. And, and you transformed the company. How did you realize that the company needed to shift? And what were some of the things that you did that allowed an agile shift so quickly to, to move to this type of marketplace? So when, when I first came in, it was so unconventional because I didn't expect to refine or refound this company and build it to my own. Uh, when we first started, it was a lifestyle loyalty app. You know, giving all the users choices of you know their favorite brands and, and merchants, buy ten coffee and get one free, kind of you know, and then you use your mobile app to fulfill that uh, at the counter. That was just a pure lifestyle app. It has no mold. There was no banking services. There was no telco services. What can consumers not live without? And those are the traditional services that we cannot live without. Becoming a lifestyle separate. Uh, I need a hundred maybe a billion dollars, you know, to really build up that ecosystem. And I, you know, there's no way we're going to acquire that kind of uh, investment. So I looked at my own personal experience, experience and said, you know, I've been with this telco for seven years in Asia, giving them about lifetime value, about maybe $80,000. And I have never been engaged by them. And then another colleague of mine said, well, I've been with this other telco for 20 years. I left them for a cheaper plan, and then eventually they called me, kept on calling me to make me stay, but after I moved out. And so one of the telcos I was with, they sent me an email to ask me why I left, and please fill out a survey to tell me why you left. So this is the type of engagement that we're getting from our traditional enterprises that we've been so loyal to, and it's broken. And that's when I said, you cannot grow just a simple lifestyle. Let me fix, let me help these traditional enterprises fix their customer engagement because they already are so, um, you know, they're, they're urgently transforming. And if they lose those customers, that's the end of their business, right? Yeah, it's, it's important to start with the pain point. I think that's, that's a critical element that they weren't missing. By the way, we have our first question from the audience, uh, and I want to make sure we have time to get to that. Uh, it looks like from Joy Zhang who says, uh, hello, do you think there'll be new super apps emerging in Southeast Asia, emerging from zero to one, or is market already saturated with super apps, traditional players? That is a trend right now, and we will continuously see this emerging. Uh, everyone wanted to be super apps, and India is just barely starting, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, Southeast Asia has, and with this dynamic of China versus everyone else, or everyone else versus China, you see that um, a lot of the China investments have left China, uh, India, and so now India has you know, very little combative behavior from, from these tech giants of, of China. So now they can innovate um, and combine their forces with North American tech giants and they're fueling the system now. The ecosystem is going to become very, very um, robust in terms of super app. Banking has not started yet. Telcos are the first ones. Uh, you're gonna see a lot more wallets consolidating. Wallets are already becoming super apps in, in India. So there's an evolution, but the next few years we'll see that whoever really innovates and capped, uh, uh, personalize and make it more relevant to the consumers will stay. It's really speed to innovation will matter. So I know we only have about five minutes left. Um, we also have one other question from the audience. Uh, Yusuf Moyes looks like you said, will there be any industries that will be less impacted from these changes? Will there be industry? Um, you know, so we... we just make sure she saw that. Any industries that are less impacted? Industries right. that will be less impacted in what way? Uh, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. We're going to see insurance companies. Most of the insurance giants will die a big, slow death. Um, a lot of them have uh, no data on their end consumers. It's all owned by agents and brokers. And so these neo fintechs coming in are getting acquired, even like Sing Life uh, here recently got acquired by Aviva. And so you have to really, the MA play will be stronger. We'll see a lot of that. And so those industries that are following, they will end up probably acquiring from their cash balance. And if they acquire fast enough, then they will emerge. But uh, we'll see a lot of the challengers moving way faster. <clears throat> 
Scott, John, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, I've got another question for you, and and this is it's it's really interesting what you're doing because in many ways it's taking the idea of you know a one product approach or a product as who you are as a company and saying that's just kind of that's sort of the the low hanging fruit you have to do that, but what you really need to do to survive and and succeed is surround yourself with all these different opportunities in order to engage people in this marketplace kind of idea. Do you see do you see that? Um, do you see any limits to that? I mean, like if you're a company and saying, well, I'm an airline, what do I do to build my marketplace idea? Is, is there a way they ought to be thinking about how to approach that? It's going to be a combination of, uh, you know, designing a brand new team from that, hiring that new talent, you, you know, the, a guy from an airline or a telco that's been there for 30 years uh, who's been announced as a new CEO, do you think that's going to really move the needle? You know, someone who's never really touched anything digital himself is now the new CEO. And so I think the board needs to be held accountable. There's a lot of pushback, right? You don't go for, um, you know, if you think about transformation, it's really through a lot of M&A. And even with some of the plays out here in Asia, M&A has not done very well for some of the traditional enterprises. And stock prices have continuously, you know, come down to penny stocks. And so if the board's not paying attention to that and they still are elevating a 30 year veteran to become a CEO by announcing that they've done a global search. You know, and then we're finally, oh, we, you know, now we're promoting a guy after a global search, we couldn't find the most innovative guy to run this new, you know, the business. This is bullshit. You know, excuse my French, but <laughs> I think the board and, and all of these you know, leaders have to be held accountable. <laughs> So, so Anna, um, you know, if you look at the late Clay Christensen, um, he focused on the why versus the what and how for industries going through disruption and building on Simon Sinek. And, and it almost sounds like part of what's happening here is if you as a company can think through the why, not of your why, but of your customer's why, then that opens up your mind to possibilities that you just previously haven't thought of because we have historically defined ourselves by the what and the how. And, and is that really part of what you're advocating when you say customer engagement and becoming more data in motion? This is inherent in startup founders ethos and DNA, right? We're always asking why, and we're, we're, we're the more disruptive ones. Uh, when, whenever we're building something, why are we doing it? Uh, and so a lot of it is really based on purpose-driven ethos. Uh, is the culture really based on purpose or is it based on month on end shareholders and you're just doing the same thing over and over again you're really not innovating and we're seeing many of these guys you know dying off and that's why simon Sinek has a job <laughs> he, he really is trying to transform leadership into a different way of thinking and it's going to be a tough uh tough I, I think journey ahead with some of these traditional brands some of those big brands have done it really well like goldman sachs you know jp morgan and guys have done tactics job evolving and building separate businesses and services and they're moving quite fast and so how do you, you know think through the the new leadership and even hiring from what you know who are those real hypos and hyper you know the, the digital natives mindset i want to hire people i want to work for not that i don't want to hire just followers and i you know admirers i want to hire people i would potentially want to be sunset you know because they're much better than me. And that's the point. And I think the, the leadership style is very different in the new age. So Scott, you've been listening. Any final thoughts on this? Well, and I think this is great. And one of the things on my mind is what you're doing to change the, the actual consumer as well. So, you know, you're continuing to escalate the expectations and, uh, and, and I, I love the attention span of a fish. Uh, <laughs> what, what customers become more valuable? Is this a numbers game? So, uh, you know, it, with the Chinese population and the, and the devotion to our devices, is that a more valuable customer segment, whether or not there is a greater absolute purchasing power or not, because there's a greater engagement power? Are there more valuable customers in different parts of the world right now? The, the customers who are valuable, if you think about it, 
you know, the data will speak for itself. Obviously, we're, we're going back to data again. Uh, it's the 80-20 rule, right? We're not trying to fix today's problem. Let's forget about it. Even I'm not the target audience. I'm playing too old now, you know, and we're really solving the next decade. And if we're not thinking about already, you know, someone asks me, well, what if, you know, the, the senior leadership team is struggling to figure out, well, if you're struggling, you really are way behind because if you're just planning, we're trying to solve the future. And if you don't have the next 10 year plan and to really innovate to solve that problem, then that's game over, right? So going back to mobile first, I think Asia's finally innovating and leading the West uh, in some aspects yep. because, you know, and there's, there's all these paradigm shifts as well because of COVID, we're now working a lot more. So mobile first is great, but then a lot of people are, are now stuck to their desktops and their laptops. So some of the solutions that were emerging as mobile first have to now build desktop capabilities. So you, you, you see where I'm coming from. I do, yeah. Great. <laughs> mobile, first, mobile first works great um, in the positive economy, but during lockdown, we're stuck to our desks for eight hours a day, um, Zoom fatigue, right? And so now we're operating on a desktop. Well, I only have mobile. Now I have to pivot and then figure out how to build a desktop solution because the users are now all stuck onto the desktop. So that will be a trend or a fad uh, and short-lived once we emerge out of this. But it's, it's an interesting you know, phase that we're going through. Yeah. So Anna, unfortunately, since our audience has the uh, attention span of a goldfish, <laughs> um, we are we have quickly come to the end of our show. Uh, and, and this has been a very insightful conversation that I really wish we could continue. And hopefully we can. Um, so as we're going out, just very quickly, if you could just answer the final question we got in the chat. Um, since we are all starting at home and we seem to look for opportunities, based on your experience, is there a play for startups to build super apps uh, that go beyond plugins for existing apps right now? If I'm an entrepreneur, should I be out there going to do this? Yes, but you can definitely do this if SoftBank gives you $100 million for your Series A. <laughs> Good advice. <laughs> well, again, thank you for that. And if you'd like to get any more insight on these conversations or continue it with any one of our guests uh, or our panelists, uh, you can reach us at Duke Corporate Education. DukeCE.com is our website. Uh, feel free to uh, reach out also to Anna at uh, Perks. And uh, we'll be happy to connect with you with her through the Duke site if you'd like that. Um, for those of you listening, we look forward to uh, you turning in on a future show. So again, uh, stay safe. Have a great day. Thanks again, Anna, for being a wonderful guest. Thanks, panel. And thank you to the goldfish that are listening. Have a good <laughs> morning, depending on your time zone. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.